Section 2, Theme, World War II, The Historical Context of World War II. Page 10, Literature Guide. Until 1939, English speakers referred to World War I as the Great War. Few would have anticipated the need to add a one since a repetition, let alone a worsening of the great international conflagration that had engulfed Europe from 1914 to 1918 was virtually unimaginable. Equipped with hindsight, however, we can now understand that, quote, unfinished business, unquote, from the Great War did in fact lead up to the Second World War. The Great War had precipitated a shock that rattled the foundations of Western civilization. Enlightenment notions of progressive development, that is, the assumption that the rational foundation of Western civilization would guarantee a steady progress toward greater peace, prosperity, and technological development, were suddenly cast into doubt. If the line of Western progress could lead to such unimaginable carnage, then there might be something fundamentally wrong with the very notion of civilizational progress. Countless people shared this thinking in writers like T.S. Eliot, who wrote The Wasteland, soldier poets Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen, novelists like Eirik Maria Ramare, aka All Quiet on the Western Front, and painters like Paul Nash and William Orpin, among many others, gave voice and image to a powerful sense of cultural disillusionment, spiritual emptiness, and moral skepticism during and after the Great War of 1914 to 1918. Thinkers like Oswald Spengler, whose influential book, The Decline of the West, written in 1918, reflected the dashed hopes of a whole generation, wrote off the notion of Western civilization's linear progress altogether. After the conclusion of the Great War, the mood in Europe was downbeat. In many places, the social fabric was in tatters, partly because of the huge gap left after almost an entire generation of young men had been wiped out. Revolutionary movements, especially on the left, were finding great resonance among the struggling working classes, and international political tensions ran high as the Treaty of Versailles imposed ruinous conditions upon Germany, fanning nationalistic sediments and giving rise to a Ravonicist mentality. Revonicist mentality, we'll have to look up that word, among the defeated people. A lot of dissatisfaction. A reaction to this sense of crisis eventually took hold as the post-war economic recovery gathered momentum in Europe and the United States. The notion of the Roaring Twenties both captures the spirit of a youth culture buoyed by jazz, frantic dance styles, female emancipation and hedonism, and denotes the bullish stock market fueled by a post-war construction boom and steep demand for consumer goods such as automobiles and wireless radios. The ensuing widespread prosperity among advanced industrial nations temporarily dispelled the pallor of cultural pessimism cast by the Great War. But we all know how the Roaring Twenties ended. The stock market crash of 1929 precipitated a global slump followed by years of economic depression leading to millions of people being unemployed and producing an ideological polarization as parties both on the far right, fascism, and the far left, communism, vied with each other to present lasting solutions to the current economic, social, and political malaise. This ideological rift came to a head between 1936 and 1939 on the Iberian Peninsula with the Spanish Civil War fought between those loyal to Spain's left-leaning Republican government and nationalists who coalesced around General Francisco Franco. This conflict ended with a resounding victory for General Franco's fascist forces, thus confirming the ascendancy of rightist aggressive militarism in Europe and beyond. Even before the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, many Europeans had a sense of foreboding, fearing that another great war was in the offing. As early as 1930, the British novelist Evelyn Vaugh predicted such a massive war in his novel Vile Bodies. One of his characters gloomingly, gloomingly foretells that, quote, we shall walk into the jaws of destruction again, end quote. 
and the end of the novel is set on the biggest battlefield in the history of the world. Tellingly, this huge battlefield resembles the front lines of the Great War as Vow was unable to picture an international war in terms of terms other than the trench warfare that had characterized World War I. Of course, in hindsight, we know that World War II was quite different from World War I. For one thing, the number of victims, already enormous in World War I, with a human toll of over 16 million killed and 20 million wounded, would be dwarfed by World War II as the total casualty number climbed to 60 million by some estimates. What also changed between World War I and World War II was the proportion of civilian victims relative to the total losses. While in the First World War, the civilian casualties accounted for far less than the military losses, around 40%, with most of those resulting from hunger, disease, and deprivation, in World War II, the number of civilian deaths climbed to about 55%, with a reasonable estimate counting over 30 million non-combatant deaths, most of them as a direct result of military action. This shift reflects the new technologies of killing, notably the greatly expanded capability of aerial warfare, which was capable of turning entire cities into raging seas of flame. Coventry, Hamburg, Dresden, Tokyo, to name just some of the largest cities subject to carpet bombing, saw storms of fire that wiped out everything, barely leaving behind the ashes of tens of thousands of people burned alive. The decision to immolate entire cities, that means burn them to the ground, was not limited to the fascist aggressors in World War II, but was equally and arguably more frequently applied by the Allied forces, including the decision to use atomic bombs on two Japanese cities. Such indiscriminate killing of tens of thousands of civilians at one go in order to weaken a belligerent country's morale to sap its pool of labor and to, to destroy its infrastructure has left a dark and troubling blot on the history of Western civilization, regardless of which side committed the atrocities. This is the meaning of, quote, total war, so often invoked in connection with World War II. Not only did the war know hardly any geographical boundaries, but it also made no distinction between the traditional battlefield and the civilian sphere. Any place, any city, any ship, even if it was a thousand miles away, could be selected as a viable target and annihilated.